Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. I am really excited to bring a video that maybe we'll do a little bit more of a series on, but for now I just wanted to get something out there for folks who are new to Spellslingers. Um, always putting up content for, you know, how to climb to Mythic, top three decks to get to Mythic, top three decks to climb with while you're in Mythic. A lot of focus on, you know, kind of like end game sort of places and you know I don't I don't want to leave out the folks who are like learning the game and hopefully they can learn from the gameplay videos and some of the other things but I thought I would just do um, a video on some budget decks you know basically starter decks uh, which planeswalkers I would personally recommend for climbing and you know learning the game and sort of you know wrapping your head around the game whether you're coming from Magic the Gathering whether you're coming from other CCGs um, because there's definitely a lot to learn, and I think sometimes it can be frustrating, right? And so we're also going to start by talking about the economy of the game and what I would recommend as a person who has not paid any money um, but plays quite a lot. So, and I think I think there are some factors that we should get into. So today we will just be really almost going back to the beginning. So, um, and and there might be things that other folks who have been playing this game for a while might have missed or um might want to tune into or recommend to friends who are picking up the game so thanks for being here and don't forget to like and subscribe there's a little button of my weird face on the bottom right corner um feel free to do that try to have content you know coming out every week um we've got a good streak we're going to try and keep you know an upload at least for each week weekday rather um and thank you for joining so let's start with the shop um, as you can see, I've got some packs that are hopefully, fingers crossed, waiting for the next set. Because uh, something I didn't realize is you could just store packs, and when you know new cards come out, um, obviously that's included in the total collection. So when you open a pack, you have a chance to open that. Um, so one tip I would say for those who have been grinding and grinding away, um, if you have most of the cards in like in the game, I think I'm probably off by like. 20 30 cards i would say and a lot of them are not super useful um i would save your packs because i'm you know i would imagine we've got a new set coming around the corner at some point we've got a new planeswalker probably dropping in the next two weeks to a month um and i'm looking forward to the next set as well so that's my first tip for those who have been grinding away um so you will see uh there's a level 40 bundle here there's a lucky number 13 staff pick. Um, I've never gotten these, but I know from talking to teammates and other folks that usually when you're buying these bundles early on, like sometimes they can be worth it. But I would say the general consensus with the game is like if you're spending in-game currency, right, whether that's coins or gems, packs are usually the best deal, right? So you can get gems as you level up. Um, or you can purchase them, but when you're leveling up, you can use them to buy packs. You can also use them, as you guys probably just saw in the opening here, you can spend 1,300 gems to get this group of cards. And I will say some of these bundles are pretty worth it. So it's it's kind of a trade-off. Like I would say, use your gold, which you can get for free, right, from doing challenges, right? It'll just give you a free, like, Okay, play four monsters, play three sneak creatures, get 150 gold, um, and I can get a mythic at the end of that, right? It probably doesn't start out giving you mythics. That's probably because I'm playing this game quite a lot. Um, but that's how you get these gold coins. And so when you, each day you'll have a deal, I already got it, um, where a pack costs 3,500 gold. You can only pay gold for one pack in, on that deal. Um, and, uh, you know, unless you're turning gems into into gold, which I think generally is not a good idea. Um, use the gold on that pack, and you'll definitely build up your collection. If you buy a pack each day with your gold, you will definitely, you know, accrue, um, you know, a pretty nice start to playing this game. Um, and you'll see you can also spend a lot of gold um, on individual cards. And that's, I would say... If you're trying to free to play, which you definitely can with this game, it takes a little bit of time, but you can definitely get there as, as I have myself here on this account. Um, I would just 
get get as many packs as you can. You're just going to get way more bang for your buck. Um, even if you get duplicates, you turn them into materials, you dust them like in any other CCG game. Um, and that'll help you craft them individually if you need to do that. But, you know, when, when you start to, like, play enough where, like, you've got 20 gold, 20k gold sitting around, um, maybe there are just mythics that would take, uh, you know, more and more packs to get or whatever, and you're missing a particular one that you want for a deck. You know, spending 25,000 on something that I'm going to use in a deck, like, that's fine, right? Like, that's a card that, sure, you could have spaced it out and gotten packs over time, but maybe you just really want that card or you really need that card. Um, even just buying commons or like, um, I think sometimes they have rares here for like 200, 300 golds, right? That could definitely, you know, grow your collection. So I think my first tip for those starting off is um, really try and spend your gold wisely. I think um, if you're playing enough and, and getting your challenges done, and hopefully your team is going to help you out with that, and we're going to talk about the team as well um, before we get into deck builds. So buckle up it's going to be a bit of a longer video um it's definitely worth it to get those early packs and then you know as long as you have uh, like maybe a thousand or two thousand gold lying around you can start spying oh maybe there are some commons or uncommons i can get and um also they always have a free a free card each 24 hours or however it is right so this will refresh in four hours i can check back again get some more free stuff um, and even if you have the cards, pick it up for free, turn it into materials. So there are a lot of ways to like really grow your collection without spending any money on the game. Um, and I think that's really great. If you want to spend money, if you want foil cool cards that are animated like this, uh, whether you craft them uh, or if you want to, you know, use gems, you know, do gem, different gem deals, um, Go for it. But I definitely wanted to talk about when you're starting out and you're maybe not sure if you like the game or if you want to spend money on the game um, through the free deal each day, the 3,500 gold pack each day, and the offering of like a common or a rare um, each day. You can really, uh, you can really uh, grow your collection pretty quickly. Um, but the other, and I would say arguably the most important thing, is to join a team right um you can see some, some of my team talking about different matchups and things like that um so really what you want to do this, this is a great example right you can request so i i already did it already but you can request materials and your team can donate up to like 15 uh of of a certain material and if you haven't seen this yet when you do craft if you have this reduces the cost of crafting white creatures by 10, right? So it's basically just discounting um, the cards that you want to make, right? So let's let's go for an example. What do I not own? Um, right, so Imrith, right? So this is telling me I can craft it, and it would be discounted, right? Like a discount's available, right? Of It takes away 150, right? For 15 materials, it takes off 150, so I'm only using 450 crystals, right? So that's that's how the crafting works and having a team where they are always doing the max donation to you and you're doing it to your teammates. It's a little tougher in the beginning because you're not going to have as many materials. But, you know, as you can see, I've done different uh, events that where I've gotten to accrue materials. So those are also really worthwhile once you get enough of a collection going. And maybe we'll do... Um, segments on the events as they come up. I ha definitely have a few events on the channel of how to grind up gold if you've got the right build. Um, but we can also talk about events where you can get materials and how to maximize on that um, when that comes up. But when I have all these materials, um, it's pretty worth it for me to just max, uh, I'll just show you guys right now, max out this donation, these donations to my team. And I'm getting gold every time I donate, and I don't need as many of these materials, and I can use the gold, as we just talked about, to go into the shop and buy this foil team captain that looks very cool. Um, <laughs> so there, there are a lot of ways to manage your resources. I think gold is probably the most important resource. Gems, I would say, like, try and hold on to them. Um, like, if you can get to, like, maybe a thousand gems, 
and hold on to them, I think that's worth it because you never know. There might be some deal anywhere from a thousand gems to fifteen hundred gems that is like perfect for you. It's got like all the mythics that you need. It's got the rare lands that you need um, because the lands definitely take a bit of time to get, and they massively improve uh, your deck. Let's see if I can. I'm able to search by lands. Will it let me do that? Um, sure, there there probably is a way. But um, let's see. yeah, like you know, getting yawning portal. It's gonna give you like free cards, especially early on. Same with Moreland Haunt. There, all the lands are pretty powerful, especially when you first start out. So like, if you ever see a deal on like a land, especially in here for gold. Um, as long as you've got that color planeswalker, like you should probably get it. Um, it's it's going to just up your win percentage. Because um, I know starting out, I was like, oh, people have lands that do stuff. That's sick. It's not always correct to do that. Um, but I would say nine times out of ten, when you're starting out, having a land that has an effect will likely up your win percentage when you first start out. Um, so yeah, so definitely find a team. Um, Let's see if we can do this. Are we able to look for a team? Yeah, so search teams, right? Um, and I think you can do it at level five or six, I want to say. And just look through. There are public ones. There are private ones. Um, there's also the community Discord that you can uh, go to for Magic Spell Slingers. You'll find people are recruiting. Um, and just go, you know, go on a team that's, like, pretty active, and you'll be in good shape. Um, so that's... Those are the broad strokes. I'm sure there there might be other folks who have gone a little bit more in depth. But again, I would say the takeaways here are save your gold for packs. Save your gold for individual cards that you need. Always check your free shop, you know, twice a day, basically, right? Because if you didn't check it one day, it'll refresh at a certain time, right? In four, hour, four and a half hours from now. Um, save your, I would say, stockpile your gems if you can. Um, when you craft cards when you open certain cards you're going to get uh this last piece of currency called keys and one key equals one planeswalker so i have all the planeswalkers i've just been accruing these keys right um i'm excited for when yan Ling comes out so i can unlock her immediately um the keys allow you to get those planeswalkers and that's gonna have us you know help us transition here to talk about what do you start with Right, you're you're given Chandra as your starter planeswalker, um, but also when you get your first second key, you know what deck should you build be building? And there, I think there are a few content creators who have for the game who have um, put out some great thoughts on budget builds, and I just wanted to add to the community and see um, what you guys think. Uh, so definitely, you know, at the end of the video, please comment and like ask questions and you know, give some feedback and, um, you know, hopefully we could really help bring more folks to the game and, you know, just have them, you know, feeling satisfied that, okay, yeah, I don't have that many cards. I don't have that much gold, but I've got a great team. I'm getting stuff, you know, week by week. And, um, who knows, maybe I'm even ranking up with the decks that I have, if not at least completing my, my challenges, uh, to get those golds, um, those gold coins. So obviously, we got to start with Chandra because she is the starter planeswalker. And, you know, I'm going to follow in the footsteps of some other folks who have recommended, you know, maybe starting with a more aggressive plan because aggro decks, what, what is an aggro deck, right? Um, an aggro deck is a deck that applies pressure through cheap cards to go underneath your opponent before they set up their defenses, right? So, I would say nine times out of ten, and for anyone who's played limited formats um, in, I think even, you know, Hearthstone in Magic the Gathering in particular, because that's one of my passions, um, you can beat decks that are stronger than you if you curve out, if you play a spell each turn or double spell at certain points and you just beat your opponent down, and usually you don't need rares, mythics, legendary cards to do that. Right, you just need a very dedicated and focused game plan um, that is going to give you the highest win percentage, the highest level of consistency. So, when you start out with the Planeswalker, you're able to splash a color, 
and green just has some of the best tools early on of common cards that just have really good stats and are just going to beat your opponent down before they know what hit them right and so you know i wanted to have this exact deck i'm going to put all the deck codes below just so it's it's easier for folks to um you know copy them to their clipboard and then they could just go into their tab and uh import them um i know in terms of convenience it's really nice to just be able to do that and then you can tweak it from there um so what do you do when you just start this game and some of these cards you know you might start out with you could definitely substitute them um for for other cards of the same cost but uh everything in this deck is either a signature card that's provided by the planeswalker or a i think a common so um let's talk about it um what does our aggro deck want to do when the signature cards that we have just for reminders flame shot right which is deal three damage to an enemy and one damage to each enemy which is even in mythic <laughs> it could be a really 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 powerful effect We've got a 3-3 three, three for 3, so fine rate, um, where you add a random spell or trap that deals damage to your hand. Just obviously good. We want to be killing our opponent, right? So it's a 2 for 1, essentially, because you're getting a 3-3 three, three for 3, and you're getting a free card. So really, really powerful. And Fire Elemental also, if your opponent is stumbling in the beginning, right? Um, even if you're playing against other Chandras and they don't have... Uh, something to block your fire elemental early on this thing is hitting them unblocked for five damage huge for two mana right so chandra has some really excellent tools at her disposal early on and torch her passive ability before the game starts she deals four damage to the opponent so they're just starting with four less health perfect for how an aggro deck wants to play so how do we build it right Again, we want to go low curve. Yes, we have a land that doesn't do anything, so we could play cards that are higher curve, but that's not what you want to do with aggressive decks. Um, you want to just apply pressure, curve out, be playing at least a spell each turn, and not having to wait around to cast things later on. And you'll see in this build that we actually have some really good card advantage, so ways to refill our hand, or at least add cards to our hand, I should say, um, while applying pressure. So. Uh, I believe this is one of the core cards that everyone gets, Filigree Fox. And really simple design. It's a one mana 2-2, two, two, right? You're spending one mana to put two power and two toughness on the board. Totally acceptable for an aggro deck. Shock, right? Deal two damage to an enemy. Um, hopefully you have this. If you don't, that's okay. I think you can replace it with just another one drop. But Shock is going to take care of those cheap creatures. It's one mana to deal two. This is one mana to put 2-2 two, two on the board. That's the kind of rate that you're looking for for cheap aggressive cards. And in the same wheelhouse, we've got Raging Goblin. One mana for 2-1, but it has haste, right? So it's, if you're starting on the, on uh, going first, right? It's essentially saying your opponent starts with two less life, right? And that's perfect, because that's exactly what Chandra's starting to do. Um, moving right along, so as you can see, so we've essentially got six cards we can play on turn one which i think is fine you can maybe add another one drop if you've got it um because you do really want to be starting out the game being proactive and then we've got a slew of two drops and we'll talk about why overgrown iguana it's two mana for four two yes this thing is going to die but i would say like the the floor of this card is it trades with something right so it it kills something and it dies and it tramples over for like one to two damage that's that's how that's like the kind of i guess worst worst case scenario is it just dies and you don't do damage but that's pretty unlikely and then the upside i'll skip uh fire elemental for a second because we talked about him a little bit just really good rate for a card um sword cannoneer when it comes into play debut right happens after you play it from your hand give a friendly creature plus two plus oh so you can make it overgrown iguana into a 6-2 trampler so it's going to trade with most cards um and it's going to do a lot of damage so and sword cannoneer worst case scenario let's say you've played an iguana turn two or a fire elemental and you draw a sword cannoneer turn three or four if all of your other creatures are pretty strong you can just pump itself so it's just two mana for a four two 
totally fine. Totally fine rate. Um, too tough just means that it will die to a lot of stuff, but sometimes it's just great to make it into a powerful threat. Goblin Shortcutter. Such an all-star in any aggressive strategy. It's a 2-3 for 2. Totally fine rate for what you're, what you're paying for. When it comes into play, given enemy creature can't block this turn. This thing can absolutely shut games down by allowing for, let's say you play, you go Filigree Fox 2-2 two, two, into Fire Elemental, into Goblin Shortcutter, their blocker that could deal with your Fire Elemental. You can just push through so much damage. And speaking of damage and the reason we're splashing green, we've got Colonian Tusker, which I think is probably the most utilized green creature in the game. It's two mana for a 4-3. This is just a huge amount of stats for two mana. And even when it's trading for a 3-3, this thing could just apply a lot of pressure if they're not dealing with it. And speaking of pressure, and I will say this takes some getting used to if you haven't played with this stuff before, uh, you know, you're new to spell singers, uh, trap cards, which are essentially, if you play magic, instants, right? They can be used on your turn or your opponent's turn, but there's a condition. And when you use this two mana, um, it, it, it'll get used up if the card gets used. If the card doesn't trigger, then, you know, the mana's not refunded or anything, it just, it would reset on your next turn. But this says, before a friendly creature fights, for anyone who knows Giant Growth, this, actually, this card actually used to be two mana, give plus three, plus three, but it's actually a little too strong, so they nerfed it to plus three, plus two, which I think was correct um but what this says is when you're fighting with your creatures um that creature is going to get plus three plus two whichever gets blocked first so a tip for y'all new players if you think your opponent has a trap you should make the block that you care the least about first right so that you can draw out the trap and then you block the creature that you really need to block second right so that's a really important tip um and again, it synergizes really well with Iguana. It makes our 2-2 into a threat. Um, it just can do... And you giant growth, your Colonian Tusker, it's just can be really, really huge. Um, and now I'm going to talk about Pyrobot for a second. I actually think this card is potentially playable like at, at way higher levels. And that, that has to do with a lot of uh, different factors, but this is a 3-mana 4-1, so it's, it's 5 worth of stats right obviously it's going to die to pretty much everything um but you can sometimes trade up right like maybe they have a three two or a four two you trading your four one for that is technically an advantage but it replaces itself right add a random red card to your hand so it's three mana put a body on the board that'll trade with something get a free card um and it's random so it could be a rare card it could be a mythic card right like it's good randomness is good when you start out this game because you have access to cards that you normally would not have access to. So that's that's my other plug for Pyrobot. Blitzing Minotaur, just a good rate. Three mana, three, three, haste. Comes in, attacks. Um, sometimes you can curve out, and this really can punish your opponent. Um, Chandra's Firecrafter, I said it earlier, a three, three for three that gives you a relevant spell that deals damage. Ab excellent uh, card. Just very straightforward, just very good. Lightning Catcher I thought was a fun one. I think you can play a lot of different three drops, but since we're dealing damage to our opponent, since we're applying pressure, why not put a 3-3 three, three that will trade for a creature? 3-3 uh, three, three for 3, totally fine rate, and when it dies, it deals 2 damage to your opponent. Um, sometimes you get your opponent so low that it's like they almost can't afford to kill your Lightning Catcher, but they're going to have to at some point. So the card has like this weird effect. I mean, it's intentional, but of making it so your opponent really wants to get this off the board as early as possible so that they're not taking two damage when it's going to really threaten them. Um, so that's my take on that. Flame Shot, you can set up so many turns where you block accordingly, getting stuff to one toughness. You take out their biggest threat, and then you just clear the board. This card is the scariest card to be playing against when you play against Chandra. Um, so if you have this in your opening hand... Unless your hand is really, really bad, you probably just keep it every time. It's always going to do work for you. And Vicious Mongrel, again, green just has 
really good starting creatures with huge stat lines. This is a four mana, four, five, five toughness, a lot of toughness. Haste comes in, beats their face. So we've got Pyrobot to, to give us cards. We've got Chandra Firecrafter to give us cards. We've got Giant Growth to buff our creatures. We've got Goblin Shortcutter to get our creatures through. We've got a little bit of removal and shock and flame shot. We've got damage applied through um, Finale with this as well as flame shot. I think this is a great place to start. I think there are interchangeable cards, but I would say if you've got the capacity to play something similar to this build, you will absolutely rank up with this. You will win games. You will win challenges, and if this is your first time opening up spell slingers and you've got Chandra and you're wondering what to do, this is a totally serviceable deck. And when you get any of the red lands, by the way, this this just like really gets uh, very strong very quickly. So that's Chandra. That's our first Planeswalker that you're going to start with. And I wanted to, at the very least, have three other decks um, across the other four colors for people, you know, based on playstyle preference. Um, I wanted it to include enough for people to have some diversity of choice. Um, but also I picked three Planeswalkers that I think r truly are the best to start with um, in terms of actually winning games, getting those challenges done, um, and feeling a bit of satisfaction with the game. So I think we will go over to... We talked a little bit about red-green, so why don't we just over to green real quick you see i have quite a few vivian decks um but let's get into our starter vivian so what does vivian do vivian is i would say just your very tried and true green monsters that are big and do damage right like chandra is like burn and aggression vivian is what i would call a little more mid-range meaning her creatures tend to be a little bit bigger cost a little bit more but potentially um, you know, really outpace your opponent uh, the longer the game goes. So, what does she do? Nurture. Pay one mana, activate. Store a random upgrade. The next creature you summon gets that upgrade. And I'll say, I was actually confused when I first played Vivian, I would say like a month ago, because I really didn't play her a bunch. Um, you have to like click her ability and hold it. So make sure you do that, because <laughs> otherwise you're going to hit it, and then you're going to be like, wait, what happened? So... How do you play Vivian? How do you use her nurture ability? It is a mana sink, right? It's like you've got one mana left over. Sweet. Convert that mana into stats. Um, and what I would say is you, she can really get out of hand when you're able to use her nurture every turn, applying an upgrade to every creature you're playing. That can be really backbreaking. But I would say uh, the quick thing you'll notice, there are no one drops in this deck. Why? Because turn one, you're almost always going to use your Nurture ability. No need to put one drops in to clog up the deck. Um, this is what you're going to be doing, turn one. Um, and it gives you a random upgrade, so that's a keyword, right? Um, or a stat buff. So it could be plus three, plus oh, plus oh, plus three, plus one, plus two, right? Or flying, haste, armor, trample, sneak, all that good stuff. Um, and obviously, if you're giving your creatures free upgrades, that's pretty incredible. So, what are her signature cards? This card is so sick. It's in all my Mythic Vivian decks. Beast Bonder. It's the best thing you can be doing on turn two. So, turn one, you're going to go upgrade. Turn two, you're going to play Beast Bonder. It's going to come in minimum as a 3-3 three, three for two mana. And every time you upgrade, it's going to get bigger and bigger. So, if you give this thing toughness, if you give it trample, if you give it armor... If you give it flying or sneak, this thing is just beating down your opponent for two mana. And it's incredibly powerful. Animal Arrow, I will say, in the higher tiers of this game, is probably not good enough. But early on, it's fine. It's saying pay two mana to draft a creature from your deck. And draft, as it says on the side here, is you'll get three options and you get to choose from them. So it's nice. You get a, a bit of card selection. And then it's going to give you a random stat buff. So uh, when you animal arrow, you should be considering what, how much mana do you have? Are you able to curve out and play that creature that turn? Or do you need to play it next turn? Okay, let me get the strongest three drop because I'm doing this on turn two. 
um, and hopefully it gets a good upgrade. So it's just a straight, um, you get a little bit of card selection, you get a one for one, right? You're trading two mana to draw a creature, but it also has an upgrade tacked onto it. So that's that's definitely beneficial. Vivian's Arcbow, um, I play this in my current Mythic build, couple different schools of thought if it is a good card or not um but i would say early on it's just good it's card advantage you're paying three mana yes for only two charges meaning you can use it twice but it's just activate give a creature an upgrade and you get to draft so you actually get to select from three options what is the best upgrade for the creature um so a lot of times what you do is you play beast bonder you play another creature and then you use your arc bow on the other creature because Beast Bonder is already getting an additional plus one, plus zero oh every single time you upgrade. So that's kind of how you want to play it. So the play pattern is always doing Nurture turn one. And then as you can see, there are a ton of two drops. And this is just my deck building choice. And, and so I'll talk about this for a second. I think being able to go turn one, Nurture, turn two, two drop without that gets the Nurture upgrade, turn three, upgrade two drop, turn Four, upgrade three drop i think having two two drops in your opening hand with vivian is extremely powerful because you're just getting two two drops like just cheaper creatures with upgrades so maybe turn two you're going beast bonder turn three you go upgrade s walled outcast right this thing's a two two with sneak already who knows maybe it, it'll get a plus three plus oh and you smack your opponent for five unblockable damage right there's a lot of upside to having cheap creatures because you can just use Nurture to make them better creatures. So, um, yes, like, you could have an aggressive curve with this deck, but you can also outscale your opponent, and we'll talk about how. So, s -Wall Outcast, you might not have this when you first start the game. I think any 2-mana two 2-2 two -two is fine. Any 2-mana something-something with, like, keywords, you know, could probably do okay. Um, but this thing's really powerful. It comes down as a 2-mana two 2-2 two -two with Sneak, um, so you get a free two damage that your opponent can't block. And then if you have two mana available when you pass your turn, it flips into a 3-3 creature and it gets sneak again. So what this card says is you can pay two mana one turn, uh, deal two unblockable damage, and then pay another two mana later where you, you don't use those mana. So you're essentially investing two mana, but you're not using it. Get, a, get another 3-3 three, three sneak. Um, so it's just a really efficient creature. Beast Bonder, we talked about. Elvish Archer, it's just a lot of stats for two mana. It's a 2-4 with reach, meaning it can block flying creatures. Um, having, giving any power to this card makes it really strong. Um, giving armor to this card makes it a lot stronger. Colonian Tusker, you know what it is. We just talked about this card. Same with Giant Growth. Grudge Match. Staple of every single green aggressive mid-range deck. It is just two mana, Pump something, plus one, plus one, fight. Have them deal damage to each other, right? So that's why cards like Elvish Archer are insane. Because you can play this, then you give a plus one, plus one. It's killing anything with three toughness, and it's surviving. It's going to be a three, five when it fights something. There aren't a lot of cards that early on that have enough stats to compete with that. So Grudge Match just does a ton of work. Um, this was a fun one. On where brawler that you know not everyone might have exactly when they start out because i don't know how the packs distribution works for like the newer sets like i don't know if they kind of give you more core cards in the beginning it's hard for me to assess like how likely it is that you have this but if you get this in your collection because it's it is a you know a common card you can craft it it's a three mana four three trample so any excess damage it does to your opponent Right, 3 mana, 4, 3 trample, pretty great rate for a creature already. And when it comes into play, give a random creature in your hand trample. So imagine, you know, getting a, a 4, 5 haste that also has trample. Um, or a briar horn that can come in as a 5 mana, 7, 7 with trample, right? Like, it's just, Onware Brawler is already a threat that they're going to have to block and deal with, and they might take some damage from it. And it's giving something in your card a free trample upgrade. So um, I thought that was a cool inc in inclusion. I think you could also just add other three drops, you know, for a similar rate. But because um, Vivian can 
uh, something I missed saying, her deck building, you can have up to eight creatures of any color. So I'm going mostly with green, just on the off chance that not everyone's going to have, you know, different um, multicolor cards and, like, legendaries that you might want to play. Um, but I think Onware Brawler is pretty accessible starting out, and I think it works with what the deck's trying to do. Arcbow we talked about, Worm's Wake. Oh, such a classic green mid-range card. Three mana, Trap. So at the end of your opponent's turn, so you'll, you'll play this on your turn, nothing happens. Then when your opponent's done with their turn, you get a 5-5 five, five Worm for three mana, which essentially has haste, because now it's your turn, you can attack with it. Um, so Worm's Wake is just, it's three mana for a 5-5 five, five worth of stats. It's huge. You know, the turn before, you can use your Nurture ability, give it Flying, give it Trample, give it Sneak, give it more toughness so it can battle even better. Um, it's just a super efficient card you should be playing. Spike Bailoff, again, we're, we're, we're looking at stats, right? Starting out, we're just going to be playing as much to what are the best stats, how can we, uh, you know, put as much pressure on our opponent as possible. Because we're not going to have special rare cards and all of that stuff to deal with specific threats. We just need to go with baseline, what is a good rate? How do I build my deck so that I can pressure my opponent? So three mana, four, four, of stats trample just a totally efficient creature there are better creatures as you get more of a collection but this is totally a fine one to start out with give this thing haste give it flying give it more stats it's going to do a lot of work for you now we move on to the higher curve uh, of the deck and yes you could play six seven drops if you wanted to but again just like aggro and just like when you start out with any sort of ccg like you need to be able to ha give yourself the ability to out curve your opponent and apply more pressure than them um speaking of pressure spear crown stag is just really good starting out it's four mana for a three four and when it comes into play it fights something so nine times out of ten you're going to fight something with two toughness three toughness comes in eats it and it gets to attack or block the next turn and worst case scenario it's fighting something that kills it but likely if you're doing that, it's something that's pretty important, right? So it's just a straight one for one. And what's great about Spear Crown Stag and Vivian, Vivian will give it an upgrade. You get plus O oh, plus three. You can plan to play this. You give it armor. You can plan to play this. Um, you give it plus three plus O oh, and it hits one of their biggest creatures with it. Um, Stag is just super, super synergistic with what Vivian is doing. Mist Raven. I have this card in my Mythic build. It's just excellent. Five mana for a 3-3 three, three flyer. Okay. For those who play Magic pretty, you know, over the years, like, that's an okay rate. Um, but what does it do? When it comes into play, it returns an enemy creature from the battlefield to their hand. So it's tempo. It's you putting a body in, getting to bounce their creature out. Um, and it also has flying, so it's got some evasion. And when you put upgrades on this thing, it can get pretty scary. So it's just a really great card to start out with. And Briarhorn, I would say, rounds out the deck with, at floor, a 7-7 seven, seven for 5. Because let's say you don't have any creatures on the battlefield. This comes in, you give itself plus 3, plus 3, and it's a 7-7 seven, seven for 5. But when you play this thing, you put it on your Mist Raven, you put it on your Spike Bailoff, that has Trample, your Onware Brawler, that has Trample, your Estwald Outcast, that is Sneak. Um, you're, you're just doing a hell of a lot of damage. And the reason we top out at five here is because we still want to just be trying... I keep hitting the land, sorry. Um, we just want to be trying to use our Nurture basically every turn. Like, that's that's how I would try and play the deck. Um, but you could also use it where you're just curving out, playing the best, uh, you know, using all of your mana every turn. Sometimes that includes Nurture, sometimes it doesn't. But if you can use Nurture and it's not going to, like disrupt your curve very much you're probably going to get an advantage from doing that so um that is vivian that is for any just green players who love playing big beasts who are just going to beat down your opponent um and i'll say as the as you get more of a collection vivian is definitely one of my favorite planeswalkers that i didn't try out early and i really wish i had so it's a bit of me trying to pay that forward to y'all i think she's a really great option to start with so we have covered red and green, and thank you folks for sticking with it. Um, I want to cover the last three colors. I think that's, uh, you know, the least I can do. 
Um, so, we've got Chandra. We've got Vivian. So, red and green. So, let's go to a very popular, very well-known planeswalker in Liliana. You know, the necromancer, the maker of zombies, and all that good stuff. Um, so, what does Liliana do? Why would I recommend her when you're starting out? She does a lot. <laughs> so, Grave Ambition. After you return a creature from your graveyard, give it plus one, plus one for the rest of the game and heal yourself one. So what does this mean? Okay, my stupid 1-1 one, one dies. I guess if I can get it to come back, it's a 2-2. Two, two. I guess that's okay. Well, what does this card say? It says Relentless. Relentless says resummon this when, with can't block the first time it dies. So when this dies, it comes back as a 2-2 two, two that can't block. And you gain a life. So you're probably asking, are there other creatures that are bigger with Relentless? And the answer is yes. So let's go to her signature cards. First off, we've got Die Hard Fan, 2 mana, 3, 2. Decent rate. And what does it do? When it dies, which is what Finale says, reduce the cost of each zombie in your hand by 1. And let me tell you, I played so many games against Liliana, one of the things I learned really early on if you can attack with this on your turn and you have all of your mana available, if they block it, that is good for you, right? You're usually going to trade it for a 2-2, two, two, a 3-2, two, 4-2, two, whatever. And then it's going to reduce everything in your hand and you're going to be able to outcurve your opponent. So um, I would say always attack with Die Hard Fan. Um, it's, just, it's just a great card to set you up. Now Zombify... For any, you know, veteran Liliana players out there, this card is the crux of why Liliana is one of the top decks in Mythic right now. Is because she has a spell that's two mana, just two mana. Look at three zombie, up to three zombies in your graveyard and summon one of them to the battlefield. When you get enough in your collection, you're going to find there are synergies where you can dump a huge zombie into your graveyard and then you just zombify it, bring it back for two mana. And it's incredibly powerful. But even in this starter deck, this card does a ton of work. So, let's talk about why. Liliana Goliath. Four mana, four, two. Oh, okay, that's not that good. It's going to die to a lot of stuff. Relentless. So, it's coming back. Okay, minimum as a five free. But it actually says something really important. After this leaves your graveyard, right? When it comes back with Relentless, when it gets zombified, double its power. Right, so usually the play pattern with this card is you trade it off for something decent and then it comes back um, with the plus one plus one from Liliana's passive. So it would come back as a 5-3 and then it doubles its power to be a 10-3. Right? And then if you reanimate it more, it's coming back even bigger. So this card is really a headache for most creature decks. Not as much of a headache for control decks. But into aggressive decks, into mid-range decks, this card's really annoying. And I'll say something about Liliana in the beginning, too. She's really resilient to aggressive strategies. Why? Because her creatures are essentially two-for-ones, because they have Relentless, right? They're trading for something, coming back stronger, and you're gaining a life every time that happens. So you're essentially dealing with their threats. They're going to have to deal with your threats twice, and you're gaining life to buffer your life total. So I think Liliana is like potentially the second key to use because if you're playing against a bunch of Chandra, Liliana can do a lot of work. Now Chandra can still beat her, but it's definitely, I think with the build that we have, and I, as you'll see, we're splashing green again. You might guess why. Um, I think you could still, you're, you're definitely favored. So let's go through it. Decaying Ghoul, baseline one mana, one for one comes back as a 2-2 that can't block, but can sometimes pressure your opponent. Um, sometimes this just says, pay one mana, gain some life by blocking a creature, comes back as a bigger creature. Totally serviceable. Zombify, we talked about. Drain Blood. Um, I think this is a card that you can get early on, um, and it works well because Liliana, having more life for Liliana, um, just draws the game a little bit more. And you can just uh, really outgrind your opponent. So draining two, meaning dealing two damage, and then gaining two life, is just a, a really solid rate for two mana. Merchant of Death. 
Very classic zombie card. It's a 2-1 for 2, totally fine rate, and when it dies, draw a card. So trade for trade early and often, get that card, right? Um, maybe if you want to bring it back, you can draw another card, right? Diehard fan we talked about. Now here is a prime reason to play green. With, with Liliana when you first start out, Bone Club Shambler. Two mana for a 3-3. Three, three. Good stats already. When it dies, give a random creature in your hand, plus one, plus one. So it's a two mana 3-3, three, three, and it's buffing one of your creatures. Great. Just just a really great rate. Now, as you can see, we're playing some cheap, kind of like, you know, easy to kill uh, zombies here, right? And something that makes them even better is Captain of the Dead, right? Just... 3 mana, 3-3, three, three, totally fine rate. Give all other friendly zombies plus 1, plus 0. That's right. You're making all of the, your zombies even stronger, whether they've already been come back from Relentless or not. Um, and you can go wide, and just play out your zombies, and just beat your opponent down. Mausoleum Witch, I actually think, is a really effective card, and I was not playing it early on, so I really do recommend it. 3 mana, 2-2, two, two, okay. Not great stats, but what does it do? comes into play give a friendly creature relentless All right so perfectly uh, perfect synergy with liliana so it's giving something the ability to come back get plus one plus one yes it can't block but now they have to deal with it again um so mausoleum witch on things that don't have finale or sorry don't have finale don't have relentless like captain of the dead bone club shambler um version of death right can be really good now i do for a note for folks we're just starting this game. You might think when a creature comes back from Relentless that its debut trigger would go off. That is not correct. It has to be played from hand for the debut trigger to happen. So if you reanimate Captain of the Dead, it will not it will not pump your entire team. So just make a mental note of that. Recycle Grotesque, one of the most classic curves. You go one mana decaying ghoul, play your immersion of death, okay? Sacrifice one of them to make them either draw a card for you to draw a card or to make your 1 1 bigger, and you get a 6 6 huge stats for 3 mana. What does your opponent do? This thing is minimum killing one of their like two creatures by itself just from having to be dealt with. So, Recycle Grotesque, incredibly powerful early on. And Undead Striker, this is a more aggressive option. There are other uh, three drops that could be good. But it's a 3 mana 3 one, eh, not good, um, but comes back as a 4-2. Alright, so it's it's just, it's going to end up trading for cards. Um, and also I love the art of him having his own arm torn off and he's trying to attack you with it. I think that's hilarious. So, um, some, some fun uh, meme value there. I think this card also is replaceable. But I'll talk about why I think it's reasonable to play. 4 mana, 2-2 two, two flyer. Pretty bad rate, right? But it's got Relentless. So let's say they block it, right? It's going to come back as a 3-3 three, three flyer. So it's essentially 5 power and toughness worth of stats across two different creatures. Um, and you're gaining a life. So I, st I think an evasion is not something that Liliana really has. Um, and I think you'll find when you're trading for creatures, you're battling for board position... Having a flyer that can peck in for two damage or potentially three damage um, and trade for some of their stuff, it, it can really get you to where you want to be. And also, if you zombify it, it comes back even bigger. So um, that's why I think it can be a good option. Goliath, we talked about, big beater, going to be a problem for them. What else is going to be a problem for them is Grave Digger. And when you hover over this card, I just want to say it will tell you, um, I think it'll say what is the strongest creature in your graveyard. Um, one critique I will say of this game, you cannot just view your graveyard. That's, they just don't have it in the client. That's not how it works. You do have a scrolling sort of, I call it the combat log on the left side where you can kind of go through and if they played a card, it'll show up. If they killed a card, it'll show up. So sometimes the, the interface can be a little clunky, but, um, four mana for three, four worth of stats. That's okay. Right. It's not the worst, not the best. And it says, Come into play, return the strongest creature from your graveyard to your hand. So you're gaining a, a life off of Liliana's trigger, and the creature that you're getting back to your hand is getting plus one, plus one. Gravedigger is just good card advantage. You trade it for something, you've gotten a card, the card's bigger, and it's so synergistic with Relentless, right? Because you're getting, like, 
three, four, five bites at the apple with one creature because it's getting two to three relentless procs off of Gravedigger, off of Zombify, and that can just be really backbreaking to your opponents. Uh, you know, you'll, you'll probably find that you have more cards than your opponent because your most of your cards are two for ones. Um, and Flagrant Fell, I think this is a spell you can get access to pretty early on. It's four mana, destroy an enemy creature. It's just a good spot removal, one for one. Get their best creature off the board. Um, and then, last but not least, another reason to run some green in this uh, starter zombie aggro. Vicious Mongrel, four mana, four, five, haste. You can give it Relentless with Mausoleum Rich, right? Um, you can't zombify it because it's not a, not a zombie, but it's just a lot of stats. It's a lot of pressure on your opponent. You could replace it with like a bigger zombie if you want to, um, but I'm telling you early on, being more aggressive, being cheaper, being more efficient, you're going to get those wins. You're going to get those challenges done. You're going to crew that gold, um, and she just can be incredibly powerful early on. So, boy, it's a lot. Uh, we've gone over Chandra. We've gone over Vivian, we've gone over Liliana, and I really struggle with this last one because I think there are so many other pretty solid starters to choose from, but I think we gotta go towards a color that we haven't seen yet, so that's gonna be blue. Now, when Yanling gets released, she might actually be a really good pl blue base planeswalker to start with. Fortunately, we don't have her yet, so I really had to think about starting out what is a good blue planeswalker, and I think for me... It's between Kiora and Ral. I think Ral has the ability to win games without the best spells. I think Kiora also has that ability. But I think, and Jace, unfortunately, I don't think is a good Planeswalker to start with. I do think he requires, as a control deck, specific threats, specific cards, specific synergies. So I'm going to go with a Planeswalker that I've come to really like a lot more and I thought was was really fun to play when I got her early on and that's Kiora. Um, so sorry to you Ral folks out there I've got plenty of videos on Ral and thoughts on that but I think we gotta go with Kiora here. So what does Kiora do? For you blue slash blue green players you're gonna know that there's a ramping strategy in this deck um, and you're gonna have some interaction you're gonna have some creatures it's, it's a really fun mixture, and I think it's a very effective blue deck for those blue players who want to be able to play this color combination. So, there's a lot to read, and we'll go through it, because I, I want to be helpful to all the folks who are starting out. So, um, Beckon Behemoth, just such a cool ability. Start the game with a fish. What is that fish? It is... Oh, is it not going to let me click on these? Well, that's unfortunate. Um... You get a free, you get spotted a free 01 creature. Okay, so I can use it to chunk box something, um, save myself some life, and that is often how you might use it. Um, but there are other things that make it powerful too. So that's just the start of the game. After you have 10, 15, and 20 mana gems, those exact numbers as you hit them, right? Add a random Leviathan to your hand. So what are these Leviathans, right? I wish I could make this bigger for y'all. I'm sorry about that. They are three 10-mana creatures that do something pretty big, as you might guess the behemoths do. So there's Eryxmethes, sort of a Greek word, I guess. Um, it is a 10-10 creature Leviathan that has Reach, Sneak, Ward, and Can't Be Countered. And you will run into some decks that run Counterspells. So um, this thing is just <laughs> brutal. So it's got reach, meaning it can block creatures with flying. It's got sneak, meaning your first attack is going to be 10 damage. They cannot do anything about it. And it's got ward, meaning it can't be targeted, can't be removed from the board after you play it. So this thing often is coming down, hitting your opponent for 10, and then they have to deal with a 10-10 after that. So, obviously a good one. Tidemaker Lorthos, um, good in other situations. So it is an 8-8 creature, Trample. That when it comes to play, debut, give friendly creatures plus one, plus one, eight times at random. So if you've got two, three creatures lying around and you play this thing, it's coming down minimum as an 8-8 eight, eight trample that buffs your entire team. But often, it comes in as a 9-9, nine, 10-10, nine, ten, ten, potentially bigger trample because it, it can buff itself. 
So, obviously a really good way to close the door on the game against your opponent. And my personal favorite, Teeny, or Tiny, Puffed Doom. A puffer fish for 10 mana. 7-7 seven, seven creature for 10. Okay, not definitely not as good stat rate. But what does it do? Debut, when it comes into play, return two enemy creatures to your opponent's hand. So, this is just coming down as a 7-7, seven, seven, totally serviceable body. Bounces two of your opponent's best creatures. Can be absolutely backbreaking, honestly sometimes better than these, if they're able to answer these threats. That is just her passive, Beckon Behemoth. So, let's talk about her signature cards, right? Cure Tide Shaper, two, a 3 mana 2-2. Two, two. Okay, not great rate, but she comes into play, get an empty mana gem. What that means is you permanently gain an extra mana gem for the rest of the game, but you cannot use it the turn she comes into play. So if you play this on turn 3, she adds 1, so next turn you go from 3 mana to 5 mana, because each turn you gain a gem in this game, or like an empty mana, or a mana gem slot. Um, so you go from 3 mana to 5 after you play this card. So... Obviously really good for the ramping strategy. Why do you want to ramp? Because you want to hit 10, you want to hit 15, you want to hit 20 to get a free gigantic problem that your opponents have to deal with. Drag Under, one of the best uh, you know, unconditional removal spells in the game early on. Four mana, put an enemy creature into the top eight cards of your opponent's deck. Right? If it's got Relentless, if it's got a like special trigger, Drag Under goes around that. Right, because it's not killing it, it's not putting it in the graveyard, it's not stunning it where it's still on the board. You are just putting it back into their deck. Now, can you get unlucky and it's put the top back on top of their deck? Sure, but you paid four mana to put their best creature right back on top of their deck where they have to replay it again. So you're almost always getting some sort of mana advantage where you're probably paying four mana to put their six, six, seven, seven, eight, eight, whatever, you know, their best creature on top. So, just a good removal spell for her. And then Octopummler, in later levels, you're not going to play this card. Uh, it's just not good enough. But uh, starting out, it's a 6 mana 8-8. Eight, eight. Huge stats, right? And it also has, uh, you know, a fun little line of text that's not always helpful. But it says, attack. Uh, when you attack, if you have a fish, give that, shi that fish plus 2 plus 2. If not, make a fish. So, um, if you've got your 0-1 line around... Uh, and it's attacking on turn 7, or potentially sooner, right, because you're ramping, um, you get to make your fish into an actual, like, kind of fighting, fight-worthy creature. Um, and if you don't have it because you used it to save life early on, which is potentially something you might need to do, um, you get a free one, right? So just card advantage, right? It's not as powerful as synergies when you get to higher tiers and when you've got more cards in your collection. Um, but starting out, this is huge body. Um, that also is like potentially spotting you a free way to save some life. So that, that would be the floor of that card. So that is Kiora. My goodness, there's so much going on here. Um, so we might as well talk about the deck, and then we'll, we'll kind of wrap up for today. So what does Kiora want to do? She wants the game to go late. She specifically wants to ramp to certain mana levels, and that's why in most Kiora decks, well... In Mythic, people go back and forth, but like honestly, you don't even need to replace Tropical Island early on if you have a blue or green land. She does really well with just getting a mana, a guaranteed mana every single turn, right? You get a mana gem on each of your turns. Um, so I, I would not, I would not replace this land, probably until you're like Diamond or Mythic. Um, you just don't really need to. There are some strategies that that uh, you know can be better, but. So what do you need to do? You need the game to go late, so you need ways of gumming up the board early. You need ways of interacting with your opponent to slow them down. You need ways of ramping, right? So that's what we're going to talk about here. So for anyone who's loved Simic as much as I have and ramping and playing big stuff like these behemoths, right? Um, this is a great, great, great starter deck. And the reason it's good is because a lot of what she does are two-for-ones. Like it's a creature that has debut trigger, or it's a big creature that can get through. Um, she just inherently will will close out the game against most opponents early on when you start uh, Magic Spell Slingers um, because she's getting spotted free, really powerful cards. So, Runeshell Crab, one mana, three, three. Okay, great stats. Can't attack. Oh, that kind of sucks. 
doesn't really matter. This thing is going to gum up the ground and give you time to set up your big leviathans, and that's what you want to be doing. Neurobot, um, there's, a, there's also a 2-1 for 2 that gives you a spell. That's fine. I think Neurobot's like slightly better because it says um, when it comes into play, add a random blue card to your hand. So that could also be a creature. Um, and I just think, like, Kiora doesn't care about specifically playing spell cards, so I'd rather have Neurobot have a wider array of cards it can pull from uh, to get a random blue rare or, like, some crazy blue creature. Um, could be a spell, could be an artifact, whatever. I think Neurobot is, like, not, mar like, that much better, but I think marginally better. Unsummon. You played this card in Magic, it could be really backbreaking. Being able to return a creature to your opponent's hand as you're developing your board can be extremely powerful. And you've also got a Leviathan, we talked about Tiny or Teeny, um, who bounces creatures too, so you can sometimes set up these backbreaking turns where you, like, unsummon on turn 9, and then, you know, they've got almost a full board, you play Teeny or Tiny, bounce two more creatures of theirs, right? It just allows you to develop the game plan that you need. Elvish Archer, Colonian Tusker, <laughs> Grudge Match. We already talked about these guys. Again, green. Best stats in you know in the game early on. So that's why we're playing them. But we've got a really cool one that um, it might take a second to make it. I'm not sure, again, how the pack distribution for the newer set, which was um, uh, Innistrad, would be. Um, but this, this card's great. Um, and I play this actually in my... Uh, Vivian deck, so if you get access to this early, I think this is a card worth playing in Vivian. Um, two mana, three one, K, okay. okay stats. Debut, draft and upgrade. Give it armor, give it sneak, give it flying. Um, give it plus O oh, plus three, give it plus one plus two. Um, it's just a really efficient early creature, and nine times out of ten, if you can put armor on this thing, blank one of their creatures, and then trade for another one, it's done way more than it needs to. So that's why that guy's good. But funnily, Merfolk, when I first saw this card, I was like, this seems like it should be good. But I think it's not necessarily good in certain strategies. But I think starting out, it's a, it's an efficient creature. Let's talk about why. Three mana for three, three. Fine rate. Debut, give an enemy creature permanently, right? Because that's how the game mechanic works. Minus two, minus zero. Right, so potentially get you know, they're 4-3, down to a 2-3. Now you can block it, can't really threaten you. Um, Merfolk, I think, is just, again, it's perfect. It's gumming up the board. It's slowing them down. That's what you need to be doing. Same thing with Soul of the Wood. 3 mana, 3-3, three, three, reach, so it's got a, it can deal with those pesky flyers uh, from, like, Kaya or when Yanling comes out. Um, fin and it has Finale, when it dies, heal yourself 3, right? So this is essentially netting you you know, six toughness worth of life, right? Because it's a 3-3, three, three, so it can block, um, you know, at worst, maybe it trades with a 3-3 three, three or a 4-3 or something like that. Um, and and you also gain three life. So it's, I think Soul of the Wood is, you know, you can replace it with other stuff, maybe that's more aggressive or has other effects, but I think it's a good card to start out with. Um, Tide Shaper, so important for what you're doing. It ramps you a full mana for the rest of the game. Very, very good. Stag, I think, is just good, especially starting out, because it's going to kill those pesky two-power creature, three-power creatures, and sometimes it'll trade for something that's good. Um, again, slowing things down, putting bodies on the board, having board presence, affecting the board. That's what you want to be doing early on when you're learning this game. Now, we're going to talk about something we haven't really seen. Artifact, right? Um... We, we did talk about it briefly with Vivian, but what does this do? It's four mana, two charges, so you get to use it twice. Activate, get an empty mana gem. Now, you might be thinking, wow, I'm paying four mana to ramp once, and that's my whole turn. Yeah, that's what you're doing. Why? Because you want to get to 10, 15, 20 mana gems to get free, incredibly powerful creatures. And it's really easy, um, especially once you get Birds of Paradise, which is, is a rare um, to get to 10 by turn 6 or 7 uh, with the amount of ramping that you're doing. Because this essentially says pay 4 mana to ramp twice. 
to add two permanent mana gems for the rest of the game. When you go Rune Shell Crab into Elvish Archer, into Cure Tide Shaper, into Shrine, they're not able to pressure you enough where playing Shrine is, is a blank turn. Um, this is going to give you inevitability, and I think it is still very worth playing in your starter deck. Dragoner we talked about, it's just really good removal alongside Unsummon. It just can slow things down. It can answer specific threats. Again, very good against Liliana, right? Because her creatures have Relentless, you can't just kill them and they go away. But this will put them back in their deck and you don't have to deal with it right now. So it works around Relentless or triggers like that. Mist Raven talked about it. Great tempo card. It's a 3-3 flyer that can peck in from, for some damage, but it's also just bouncing their most threatening creature, giving you time. And, forgot to mention this, when a creature has been buffed on the board and you bounce it back to their hand, it loses the stat buffs, right? So if you play against a Johnny, who's constantly like buffing their creatures and getting them bigger and bigger, when you bounce them, they lose those added stats. They just go back to a base copy of what they are. Um, so that's, that's a, a nice tip. Um, and then Octopummler just rounds out the deck as your your six drop, um, because probably after this you're playing your ten tens, <laughs> which is super super fun. Um, and I think QR you could climb with. I think it's it's just a really really powerful deck early on because you're getting spotted these incredibly strong cards later on in the game. So all you need to do is just live. Um, so aside from the signature cards. Uh, for each deck. Each deck we talked about today um, is just commons, I think, or uncommons. So I really think, uh, just to sum it up, you start out with Chandra, whether you want to branch off into Liliana to beat up on Chandra, whether you want to branch off on Kiora to beat up on Liliana um, and potentially beat out Chandra, or you want to play Vivian because you're a diehard green beast player you want to get those cool upgrades you want to have game kind of against everything um i think we went over four planeswalkers one of which you start with but three that i would highly recommend to start uh growing your collection uh getting those win streaks getting those challenges done um and i hope today was helpful i'm going to try and bookmark and code like not only each deck and what we talked about but like specific you know tips and tricks here and there because there is a lot to get used to when you first start this game um and for veteran players who happen you know to to be here and want to recommend this to friends um or you think about even starting another account where you just like play wacky decks or whatever um you know and just wanted to explore other planeswalkers i hope that this gave some info to you guys too so um that's it for us today uh thank you for sticking with it i know it's a long one and uh we'll catch you back here next time. Thanks.